uh, the mental mode of despair and agony and I'm, I'm not there. I'm, uh, chapter 13 is a continuation of Job answering Zophar. And uh, he's, he's, he's got his belly full of them already. Uh, they've attacked him and accused him and um, uh, pretty much said, you know, the proof, is, the proof is in the judgment. You know, say the proof is in the pudding. The proof is in the judgment. What, the reason God's done this to you is because you're wicked. We just don't know what you did. And, of course, you know, Job knows he hasn't done anything. You know, we know that he hasn't done anything. He doesn't know why God's done this. And uh, all he knows is that he has done as right as he can. Yeah, it's kind of like that Jew. He's done as right as he can. He can't, you know, Jews got to ask the same question. Why? 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 I mean, why the Holocaust? I mean, we're not just talking the Holocaust. We got the Spanish Inquisition. They went after the Jews during that. It's just like every so often, or every uh, 20 or 30 years, somebody goes after them somewhere around the world. I've heard that uh, the only two nations that have never persecuted that Jew is Norway and the United States. I don't know if that's true or not, but I'm headed to Norway if things really bust apart here. I hear they got all kinds of social programs and everything, but they have a, a, a capitalistic society. It's supposed to be a, one of the better places to live on the earth. I don't know. Um, I'm just kidding. I'll probably not be going anywhere. Um, huh? They tax the what? They tax them, do they, for being poor? Oh, they pay for their program. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's understood. I thought you said they tax the poor. Wow. Hey, I think everybody ought to have skin in the game, you know. I believe that. If everybody's got skin in the game, everybody will make the right decision about the spending. Ever thought about that? And when somebody doesn't have any skin in the game ever, well, they don't mind spending your money till they'll spend you to death. All right, away from that. <laughs> Haven't even started to get into politics, man. It's all over with. Job chapter 13, verse 1. He says, Lo, mine eye hath seen all this, mine ear hath heard and understood it. What ye know, the same do I know also. I am not inferior unto you. <laughs> so Job lets his three friends know, first thing, that, um, that they have not enlightened him with all their pontificating. Uh, he, has, he has seen and heard and understood all of their arguments. Uh, they're not dealing with somebody that doesn't know any Bible. They're dealing with somebody that probably taught them the Bible. And the other way around. I mean, he, he knows, he knows, and I don't he understands their arguments. He's, he, he's way ahead of them. He's already thought that through. Of course, he knows what he's done and what he hasn't done. They don't. But he's telling them, I already know what you're talking about. I already know that. And he says there that, this is the second time that he says about not being inferior. Look in uh, chapter 12, verse 3. Turn back a chapter. And he says there, and this is again, he's answering Zophar, so he's saying it twice to Zophar. He said, but I have understanding as well as you. I'm not inferior to you, yea, and who knoweth not, uh, not such things as these? So he's kind of repeating himself that, All right, I know already know these things. And when he says I'm not inferior, I think of, you know, Remember, uh, Job is a type of the children of Israel. And you know what that, the issue has been in their place in this world? An issue of inferiority. Whenever they're persecuted, they're, they're considered to be an inferior people. Um, and it's followed that Jew for nearly two millennia. I mean, they, you know, the, the, um, the Muslim, I don't think there's a Muslim-run country on this planet that teaches that Jew is a human being. They teach of him less than human. Uh, the Nazis, they would, uh, they would um, draw him as apes and uh, animal-like, a beast. Um, the the uh, Muslim countries teach that the, the Jews will eat Muslim children during Passover. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, all kinds of lies have been taught. But they've, they've always had this thing. And here Job, he says it twice, I'm not inferior to you, I'm not inferior to you. You know, if anything, if, there, if, you, ever, if you ever want to pick a superior race out there, it'd be the Israelites, it'd be the Jews. 
uh, the amount of scientists that come out of those and doctors and uh, discoveries, oh, it, it's, it's, Im it's immeasurable. There's just thousands and thousands of them. And they've been blessed in a way that, you know, other, um, other races may not have been blessed. But I'll tell you what, they're, they've, they've suffered persecution. They've suffered it for nearly 2,000 years and told how inferior they are. Job says, I'm not inferior to you. And, you know, you look at their military. Is it inferior to anybody's military? It's small, <laughs> smaller, but it's not inferior. Their, um, their intelligence agency, the Mossad, it's not inferior. Their scientists aren't inferior. Their doctors aren't inferior. I mean, there's some smart ones out there, some really smart ones. They seem, to be, they seem to be a lot of rich ones, too. I think that might be the problem. Envy. Class envy. They, they, they hate that Jew because he can succeed, and usually does. And sometimes at the expense of the Gentiles, he'll succeed. But one thing I know is that if you want God to bless your nation, you better bless their nation. And the stand that we ought to take in this country and, uh, and the stand that our present president takes is the stand that I take. And that is, he is blessing that Jew about as much as he can. Now, I know this peace thing ain't going to last, and you know it ain't going to last. But you know what? Him trying is not going to hurt a thing. And him moving, uh, him moving that um, um, embassy to Jerusalem, not a bad thing at all, man. Anything like that, you know, where the Lord has to take notice, says, oh, now I have to bless them Americans one more time. Because he said, I mean, that's his promise, right? I'll bless them that bless thee. I'll curse them that curse thee. And, um, hey, as long as, as, long, as long as Trump's blessing them, God's going to have to bless this country. Maybe that'll give us a little bit of extra time. Maybe that'll give us a respite. Maybe, I don't know. It just seems like the whole thing's going to burst apart here in about a week, but we'll see. Uh, so the Holocaust with the Nazis is a small picture of what will transpire in the Great Tribulation. Uh, the Jews will be hunted worldwide. They'll be sacrificed on altars, and they'll be eaten. The Bible, the Bible does tell you they'll be eaten. There will be cannibalism in the, in the religious services. He says there, turn to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 11, 13. And then there's some I don't understand. There's some things I don't understand about this. And uh, I've listened to what Dr. Ruckman has to say, and I still don't understand it. Um, he says the tithe comes from this right here. The concept of the tithe, the tenth, comes from this right here. It says, um, Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted. This is uh, verse 11, I'm sorry. I've, Isaiah 6, 11. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the, whor and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land, but yet in it shall be a tenth, and it shall return, and shall be eaten as a teal tree and as an oak, whose substance is in them when they cast their leaves. So the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. Now, like I said, there's a lot about this verse I don't understand. But notice he mentions there that a tenth of them be eaten. And Dr. Ruckman says, and I don't know how it connects, but somehow that tie, that tenth, is because of this. Ultimately, because of this. And um, again, I, I wish I could explain that. But one thing's for sure, they are, uh, you know from, I think, Revelation chapter 6, where they're beheaded for the witness of Christ. They're sacrificed. And it, there's a, uh, Daniel, Daniel chapter 8 and 9 talk about that in the midst of the week, he'll cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. And that's those daily sacrifices. Uh, one, thing, one thing you know for sure, if you ever hear that Israel's going to start up those daily sacrifices, oh, you better get your bags packed. Because from the beginning of that thing to the middle of the trib, that thing's going on because in the midst of it, he causes it to cease. And what happens is, it's not that he stops sacrificing on that altar. He stops sacrificing the sacrifices that Moses said should be on that altar. Because there's another verse in Isaiah, and I couldn't, I didn't write it down, but it talks, about, it talks about men, it talks about dogs, and it talks about pigs being offered, as if they offered a, a pig or a dog or a man. And 
You got to look and think about the devil. Here he, he's, he's, he's going to have that mercy seat. And so what's he going to try to do? He's going to desecrate that thing as best he can. And offering a dog on that thing or offering a, uh, a, a pig or a human being. And Dr. Reckman says they're going, to, they're going to drink the blood of those Jews and it looks like they might even eat their flesh. Of course, that's not a, far, that's not a big stretch for any Roman Catholic. You do understand that. Every time they put one of them wafers in their mouth, they say Corpus Christi. They believe it's the body of Christ. Literally. There was a, um, and if you, well, don't, don't rent it. But there was a, um, there was a documentary out about those uh, 20 uh, soccer players from Chile. They were flying over the Andes, I think it was, and they crashed. And they were up there. They, they couldn't find them. They were up there for a long time. And they made the decision to eat the corpses. And uh, a lot of it, because every one of them is Roman Catholic, and they thought, well, if the priest can do it, so can we. <laughs> I mean, he turns that thing, that bread, into the body of Christ. You know, hocus pocus. So they thought, well, you know, if it's okay for us to eat the body of Christ, why, is, why isn't it okay for us to eat the body of a friend to keep us alive? Okay? I'm not criticizing that decision. I'm just saying... That's how they came to that, uh, to that decision. So, um, one of these days, the, uh, uh, and during the Great Tribulation, they're going to start sacrificing men, and dogs, and pigs on that altar. And a lot of that has to do, if, you were, uh, if you've ever studied in between your testament about uh, Antiochus Epiphanes that uh, offered a, a, a pig on the altar, and it was the, uh, the Maccabees, I think Judas and James Maccabees, I think was their name. And they came in and fought um, Antiochus and, and his uh, group and uh, was able to secure the, uh, the temple and, the, the, and they cleansed it. And they were able to, I don't know, cleanse it enough to b begin sacrifices and things. And of course, that's, you know, everybody, they try to apply all the things in the book of Revelation to that time frame. Not even reading the same book then. Because what I'm reading over there in the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, uh, it was a lot more than Antiochus Epiphanes offered a pig on December 25th on the altar. A lot more. So, anyway, he says, uh, What ye know, the same do I know. Also, I am not inferior to you. Verse 3, Surely I would speak to the Almighty, and I desire to reason with God. Was, Job's kind of really just done at this point with his friends. Uh, you know, it's like uh, people are stubborn, you know, and when you're talking to somebody, they think they've, they've got the right angle on it. I mean, some people just won't relent. They just keep it up. And uh, he's, you know, he's only been going at it for a few chapters with him, and he's going to go a lot more chapters. But he wants to, he wants to reason with God because he knows you guys don't know the whole story. You don't know really what's going on. I want to talk to God about this thing. Uh, he wants to go to the very source of his discomfort. And he knows that's God. God is the source of his discomfort. Um, but any dealings with God, any reasoning with God, are going to put your sins front and center. And you will not move one inch further till that issue is resolved. That is the issue that God has with every man and woman on this earth, the age of accountability is your sins. You'll deal with that or you will not deal with God. Ultimately, everything He does for you in answered prayer is for that issue to be resolved first. Because He says there in Isaiah 1.18, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So the only thing God wants to reason about is the issue of a man's sins. And the same is true with Job. Now, Job's sins is not the sins that his friends think are the problem. There's something else. Israel's sin is the same as Job's. And that is rejecting the truth that they need the righteousness of God, uh, or rejecting the truth that they need the righteousness of God to be saved rather than the righteousness that is of the law. That Jew knows that he is living, he is living a pattern and a lifestyle that is superior to any Gentile on this earth. 
He is not only he is concerned not only about his clothes, but he is concerned about what he puts in his mouth. Everything that he does is according to a strict standard. And because of that, I mean, they think, well, we're living better than everybody else. Job's kind of thinking that himself, don't you think? I'm living better than you guys. Why are you condemning me? So, in John, uh, John 14, 6, oh, you all know this verse, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Well, that's not the righteousness of the law, is it? Job's missed something. Uh, in going about to establish his own righteousness, which is where uh, we've looked at this verse a couple times, in, J in Romans 10, verse 3 and 4, it says, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Ultimately, that's where Job is at, and that's where the children of Israel are at right now. For Christ is the end of the law for, for righteousness to everyone that believeth. You remember that uh, uh, during the revival, um, Brother Dave brought up the verse, Revelation 21, 23. You know, the Bible says, for all sin to come short of the glory of God. Okay? And uh, the, I've always taught, I've always tell that center of the glory of God's heaven. You know, I think I was told that and I just repeated that. You know, the glory of God's heaven, that's where his glory is, you know. But actually, Revelation 21, 23 identifies God's glory, uh, it says, And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it. And then it defines what it is. And the Lamb is the light thereof. Oh. So, when he says, For all sin to come short of the glory of God, they've come short of Jesus Christ, who is the standard of righteousness. That's who they've come short of. And that Jew cannot understand that. That's when Jesus Christ shows up. He said, if I had not come, you not, you, you not known your sin. But when he exposed their sin, they just got angry. When they, listen, God's trying to expose Job's sin. He's getting angry. I mean, the Lord's really getting down there and digging, man. You know, some people live, they're so religiously right, that righteous living that God has to really turn up the heat. He doesn't have to turn up the heat too much with me, man. Not much. I fold like a deck of cards. <laughs> House of cards, man. I mean, I know what I am. I know what I am. But some of these people, they live, I mean, listen, they're disciplined. I mean, they just, they don't have, they don't have any kinks in their armor. At least they don't think so. Chinks? Chinks in their armor? Okay. I didn't want to be racially uh, insensitive. No kinks in their armor? Can't, you can't go. Okay. You know, huh? Yeah, imperfections, yes. Matthew 6, 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and what? What is his righteousness? It'd be Jesus Christ, right? No man cometh to the Father but by me. The children of Israel missed it. And Job has missed it. He's not, he's not wicked. He just missed it. <laughs> he missed what he really needed. But he's living a good life. I mean, he, he'd be the best neighbor you'd ever want. I mean, Job would come running. And there are folks like that. There are neighbors like that. He, you hear him. He'd give me the shirt off his back. I mean, you hear that all the time, you know. And there are people like that. And it's wonderful to have a neighbor like that. But it's also, you know, you cut, they're the hardest ones to try to win to Christ. Because you know what they do? Here, here's how it works. They see the hypocrisy in us. Some of them are living, you know, they said the children of darkness are wise in their generation, the children of light. And sometimes they live so much, they live better than us, cleaner than us, more wholesome than us. And so we look hypocritical to them. They don't realize we're just a bunch of mangy sinners saved by the grace of God. They come from all different backgrounds. So it's easy for them to dismiss it. But listen, you're not getting to heaven based on my righteousness. <laughs> I mean, if all you had to do was meet up to me, everybody get in. But you've got to meet up to an absolute perfect standard. 
And that's where you're going to fall short. It's not about keeping all these legalistic laws that they're keeping. Because Job is doing that. And that's, I mean, why would this happen to Job? He's doing the very best that he can. He's doing better than anybody he knows. The Bible says, a perfect man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. He's just missing that the real righteousness is with God, not with him. So anybody who's honest with themselves, trying to live a good life, a religious life, know they fall vastly short of a sinless life. Uh, Romans 7, 13 says, Was then that which is good made death unto me? And it's referring to the law. But God forbid, but sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. The law is good, the Bible says. It's not the law that's the problem. You're the problem. You're the weak link. I'm the weak link. And what happens is the law comes in, and it, for some reason, and I haven't figured this out, but in some reason it did the reverse with the Jew. He actually used the fulfilling of the law to say, look how righteous I am. When the law was given to show how wicked you were, how sinful you were, that sin might become exceeding sinful. That's why God didn't stop at one law that said, you know, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and he added 613 laws. Why? That sin might become exceeding sinful. It should have proved just the opposite. It should have showed them they had a need. They had a need for something other than the law. But they rested in it. They excused themselves. The fact that i gotta, you know, I got to grab some animal by its horns, you know, and slice its throat from ear to ear kind of tells me something that I'm supposed to, you know, lay my hands on that thing and, you know, it's in my stead. Would kind of give me a hint, there's something wrong with me. If I got to do this to this animal, I mean, something innocent dying in your stead. But somehow they didn't get it, and they started to establish their own righteousness, and they did it through the law. So it says, Surely I would speak to the Almighty. I desire to reason with God. Well, not if you're not going to. You know, the Lord just hits him right between the eyes when he, when he starts talking to him. Um, verse 4 says, But ye are forgers of lies, ye are physicians of no value. <laughs> you know what we call physicians, right? Call them doctors. These are, these are doctors of science, doctors of religion, doctors of philosophy, doctors of education, and even doctors of medicine. The world's full of doctors. Do you know not one of them doctors I just mentioned, not one of them, can give you an answer about anything eternal. Not one. Uh, they could build you a house. They could build you a skyscraper. They can take out your spleen. They might even be able to treat your cold. They won't cure it. They can treat it. <laughs> they might be able to treat your COVID-19, you know. They might be able to give you all kinds of uh, uh, philosophy. They might be able to examine your head and see where you're at. They might even be able to give you a lot of religious things that... Uh, our religious living that uh, they, they, he might, they might try to convince you to do, but they can't give you not one answer about eternity. And the problem is that these so-called doctors, they think they're so intelligent, they think they're smarter than God. And they start forging lies. You know why? Because they don't know. They don't know. And Dr. Reitman made this statement. He said that, the one thing that they, they can't tolerate, the one thing they can't stand, the one thing that they never want to happen to them is to be ridiculed. So they'll go with the flow. I mean, listen, if it's a, uh, um, if it's a, uh, what's this environmental thing? Climate change. Was global warming, now we're freezing to death, now it's climate change, you know, whatever. They just keep changing it. But they'll go along with that. Why? They don't want to be ridiculed. They don't want somebody, and, and the thing is that, you know, there's this whole group or block of people that would ridicule them. You know, we stand for the truth because we believe a book. Doesn't matter what the doctors say. Doesn't matter how much education they have. Doesn't matter how much, how many, uh, uh, you know, how much of the alphabet they got behind their name. It doesn't matter to us. We have absolute truth. 
we're dealing with absolutes. And these doctors think that they can... It's like this, you know, it's like a doctor of religion. Correcting that book. Listen, let me ask you this. Can you name one? Can you name one of these Bible teachers or one of these evangelists that are on TV that are the big names, not, the, not that one channel that nobody goes to, you know? But on the main, on the main ones, ABC, CBS, uh, NBC, whatever, uh, that believes the Bible is the Word of God without error and that teaches that. Is there one? Does anybody? I don't ever watch those people. Um, I know Stanley doesn't believe the Bible is the Word of God. I know that MacArthur doesn't believe the Bible is the Word of God. There are two of the probably biggest. There might be some more now. I don't know who they are. But does anybody know one that's actually a Bible believer? No? What's, uh, what's that one guy? Um, no, I'm not Jeremiah. I don't, I don't know anything about him either. Huh? Is he, is he, on, the main, is he on the main ones? What about... Uh, the guy that talks about Israel all the time, Hagee, is he a Bible believer? Anybody know? Now, I, I didn't say that they used the, use the King James. I'm saying they believe it. And they say that they believe it. You know why they won't say it? They don't want to be ridiculed. That's exactly why they don't say it. But the reason the doctors of this world, they, they forge lies. And you know what they do? They pose uncertainties. Everything's an uncertainty. I mean, we, we, we can't even say anything for certain anymore. All things are relative. Because, you know, everything's in a flux in this country. Of a, it's a mess is what it is. And rather than state something, say, this is absolutely what I believe about this, they just kind of get mealy mouth and hide behind something, you know. The Lord Jesus Christ couldn't stand these people. He wouldn't even talk to them. In John chapter 12, verse 42 and 43, uh, Herod, I mean, he's one chief ruler. It says, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. It says, For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. That's it, man. The praise of men more than the praise of God. I thought I had another verse here for that. Uh, it's, it's in here somewhere. Oh, here it is. Um, I'm going to hit the, phys the physicians down here cannot cure what ails the soul. They just can't help you in that, that instance. Uh, what you need is a preacher, not a doctor necessarily, just a preacher. Someone that knows this book, believes this book, they can help you. They can help you on those eternal things. It says, phys phys or, um, um, I put down here, physicians don't, Physicians down here cannot cure what ails the soul. Only the great physician can do that. And in Matthew 9, verse 11 to 12, when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that behold need not a physician, but they that be sick, or they that are sick. And he's talking about sin. He's talking about sin. He's not talking about, he's not talking about a, a, a medical condition here. Publicans and sinners, why is he eating with them? Because he's got the cure. He's got the cure for what ails the soul. And that thing is sin. Uh, it's not possible for God to reason with someone who thinks they're smarter than he is. You're always dealing with a deficit when you've got somebody that's got, you know, they've got a degree. Man, I mean, you would think that, you know, do you imagine this planet's in the back shape of an S-shaped nebula? Okay? We're like a speck of dust in this universe. I mean less than a speck of dust. How much knowledge do you really think you have compared to a universe out there? How much do you think you have? Well, if you said 1%, you'd be, you'd be a fool to say something like that. You, if you said 0.1 of 0.1%, you'd be a fool. You have so little knowledge, it's, it's indescribable. Yet, you get a degree and think that you can tell God how things should be. That's how people are. He said in uh, James 4, 6, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he, he saith, God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace unto the humble. God's more likely just to ignore them, not deal with them. Why? They don't want to reason together with him because the issue is about their sin. In Luke 23, verse 8 and 9, 
It says, when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see, to see him of a long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Then he questioned him in many words, but he answered him, nothing. Nothing. Here's what you get. He tell, Herod's trying to talk to him, ask him all kinds of questions, you know. Can you do a miracle? Can you, can you turn this water to wine? I heard you did that. Can you raise it? Here, I'll kill this guy. Raise him from the dead. <laughs> I mean, Herod wants to see something. Herod wants to know something. Tell me something. Tells him nothing. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. There's a verse over there in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26. It says, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men... After the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Queen Elizabeth said, thank God for an M. Thank God for an M. Queen Elizabeth, and I'm not talking about the present one. <laughs> I'm talking about Queen Elizabeth, the one that uh, left the throne to King James. I believe that woman was saved, but she says not, it says not many noble. What if it had said not any noble? She said, thank God for them. Not many mighty. Those that have the power in this world and the strength in this world, they seldom turn to God, and especially not many wise men. Sometimes, we, I mean, they just get to thinking they, they know more than God does. You know, Job's got a little bit of that. If you see the way that he's talking to his friends and everything, he seems to... He seems to think that, you know, well, if, if I could reason with God, we'd get this thing settled right now. Oh, yeah, we'd get settled all right. You'd be in dust and ashes saying you hate yourself. God getting through with you. I mean, I don't, I, there are some people think that somehow they're going to get up there before God and they're going to mount this argument. They've already got it in their head. They're going to mount this argument and God's just going to get down off his throne and bow before them and say, yep, you should be God and not me. My Bible says he overcomes them. He overcomes all of them. Doesn't whether it's angels or cherubim. Doesn't matter whether it's men or devils or demons or whatever it is. He overcomes all of them. Because, and he's going to overcome them with sound argument and wisdom and righteousness. You're not going to put anything over on God. He's going to put it over on you because you're wrong. <laughs> you're just in the wrong. So he said, not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Verse 5, he says, oh, that we would uh, all together, oh, that ye would all together hold your peace and it should be your wisdom. <laughs> um, I don't know, Job wasn't around, I mean, uh, Proverbs had been written, but Solomon, I don't know if he, he got this verse from, from Job or not, but Proverbs 17, 28 says, Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise. And he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. <laughs> you know, they say people who learn to listen, and I know this leaves me out. I'm, all I do is jabber, jabber, jabber. So, But he says, people who learn to listen rather than blathering on are deemed much more intelligent. Um, Amy Coney Barrett, you've been watching, if you've watched that uh, thing, you ever see how intently she listens? That's why she's so intelligent, because she's not talking all the time. She's listening, and then she talks. Um, I, I had a, a, a missionary friend one time that uh, he went to this missions conference, and um, there's this missionary there that he knew, and and you know, he just this missionary just didn't say a word. <laughs> I mean, barely opened his mouth. And the reason he didn't open his mouth is because he had nothing really to say or to add. You know, he was just that kind of guy. Man, he was not that bright, but, you know, he just, he just didn't have anything to add to the service, so he kept his mouth shut. And um, he said by the end of that service, they had hailed this guy as one of the wisest men that, you know, ever, ever been in the building, you know. It just, he said, you got, you got, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> And I just, I can see that. You know, sometimes people think you're smart just because you keep your mouth shut. But when you open your mouth, you prove, them, you, you prove them wrong, you know. And then they find out, you know, 
That's why it says, you know, this profession I'm in is uh, the foolishness of preaching. I'm always opening my mouth. I'm bound to say something stupid sometime. The Bible says in a multitude of words, there one if not sin. You know? I think it's why preachers get in more trouble than most people. They're always talking. And the more you talk, you keep digging that hole. <laughs> so you got to be careful. But he said, if you just hold your peace, he said, you know, you'd appear wise. I'd think you're smart if you just held your peace. You know, they should have held their peace for what he was going through. So as long as your mouth is shut, there's no evidence that you're a fool. <laughs> you think of that. I mean, some, I'm learning. It, but it, believe me, this has taken me decades. Um, but I'm learning just, somebody will say something, I'll go, mm-hmm. I won't say a word. I've learned. Do not open your mouth. Somebody will say something, okay, okay, mm-hmm. Pray about that, you know, or something, you know. I'm not too good about, you know, dodging the answer, but they're looking for me to say something, make a judgment, I won't do it. Because why? Because I haven't heard the other side of the matter. And there is always the other side of the coin, Always another side of the matter. And listen, you're a fool if you answer it if you haven't heard it. Remember that. Um, I had a thought I had a verse on that. I didn't put it down. It talks about a man that answers a matter before he hears it. And that's taken me a long time because I'm big blabber mouth and I'm, you know, I think I know. But you know, even when you're listening to somebody's problem, oh. You're getting this, they're telling you their problem from their vantage point. And you're taking it all in, you say, oh, you're right. That scoundrel, he ought to be drawn and quartered. He ought to go to prison for the, I mean, you're just making all these judgments until you hear the other side of the story. And you're going, well, no, I don't know. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know, that's what you need in a judge. Somebody that listens, it's impartial. Somebody keeps their mouth shut and hears both sides of the thing. You know what we do in this country? We rush to judgment. Oh, I mean, politically, that's all we do. Rush to judgment on everything. Better hear the other side of it. I mean, somebody mentioned uh, Sunday about somebody that's on the ticket and said, you better, you know, this guy's been accused of this and that. You better go read the rest of it. You better go see the other side of it. We did. Because there is two sides to it. And then you've got to make a judgment call. But at least you've got all, all, the, all the pertinent information. Proverbs 18, 13. Thank you. Write that down here. Okay. Verse 6. He says, Hear now my reasoning and hearken to the pleadings of my lips. So Job's about to turn the tables on his three friends and give them something to think about. So he says, now hear now my reasoning. And he says there in verse 7, will you speak wickedly for God and talk deceitfully for him? He's saying, in judging me, aren't you speaking in God's place? Because as far as I can tell, God hadn't spoken yet, had he? So these three friends take it upon themselves... To speak for God. That's what they're doing. They're sitting in judgment on Job and speaking for God like, we know why this has happened to you. You know what Romans 14.4 says? Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall behold not, for God is able to make him stand. Hmm. Now I'm not going to tell you you can't judge. What I'm going to tell you is you cannot judge in God's place. And if God hasn't spoken on the thing, you best leave it alone. Uh, there's a verse over there, Matthew 7, verse 20. It says, Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. You can be what we call a fruit inspector. Okay? You can say, by these fruits, I know this individual is not doing the right thing. Okay? By their fruits ye shall know them. But you better leave, you better leave the rest of it up to God. And you better wait on him. Um, 
I mean, you can judge a man by his fruits and say whether they're good or bad, but you cannot judge him as far as whether God has done with him or not. You don't know that. There's an example of that in the Bible. Um, I think it's um, Acts 13, but I could be wrong, where Paul and Barnabas, I believe, are, 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 are wanting to go on another missionary trip, and Barnabas wants to take uh, John Mark, and they take him along, and then all of a sudden, uh, Paul gets real rough with one of these heretics, you know, and blinds him or something like that, you know, and John Mark gets all, you know, I just believe in love, and <laughs> I just believe we ought to love everybody, and, you know, and he gets all upset and offended, and he leaves. Well, they, when they get ready to go out again, Barnabas wants to take John Mark again. He says, no, no, not having it. Not taking that guy with me. He left us the last time, left us in the lurch because he got offended because I blinded that heretic. So you see John Mark completely out of it. I mean, he ends up going with Barnabas, and Paul ends up going with Silas. That's how Silas got linked up with Paul because Barnabas, they, they, the Bible says that contention was so sharp that they parted from one another. And then God got two missionary groups out. That's how we get Baptist churches, too. Same way, you know. We split and split and split until we splinter, and then the splinter split. And that's how Baptist churches are everywhere, because we split. And that's sometimes that's how God's got to do things, you know. You never move out unless God doesn't cause a problem. Split the thing. Anyway. But, um, but he says here in 2 Timothy 4.11, Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee. For he is profitable to me for the ministry. God wasn't done with him yet. Paul knew that. Paul just said, I don't want to bring him with me. He's got some maturing to do. He's got some growing up to do. And this is too important to have him along. He's a novice. Let Barnabas train him, you know. Maybe Paul was right. Maybe Paul was wrong. But Paul said, I want to take him with me. So Barnabas took him and, you know, whatever happened, you know. I mean, Paul, I think Paul was rude in speech, you know. I think he was like a Dr. Ruckman. But I'll tell you what, the words come out of his mouth. Bless your heart. I mean, if you believe that book, it's just a blessing. I've never, I've never been bothered by, by the way it was presented, or I've never, I've never in my life thought Dr. Ruckman was offensive. I've always said, what? Dr. Ruckman? <laughs> They're like, you mean you, don't, you can't say, no, no, I can't. I can't. And you know, I don't think they felt that way. Uh, the people that knew Paul felt that way. The Bible says they fell on his neck. They kissed and wept over him. They said they longed for the words which he spake. That's what I remember him saying about him. I think some people just got it in their head. They just don't like it this way. And you can't take the word of God like that. Um, you know, you'd say there's a little bit of difference in Brother Dave's preaching and mine. I mean, wouldn't you say there's a little difference? The fact that he's about 300 decibels louder than me, and that he's, he's stomping and snorting and accusing you of everything, and after your Facebook and all that. But you know what? Does that offend you? I mean, as long as that guy's giving me the book and teaching me something and preaching something and helping me, it doesn't offend me at all. Yeah, it, might, it might hit me. It might, it might, it might just, you know... Chafe me raw, but as long as it's the Word of God. So sometimes it doesn't matter how it's being presented. He says there, will you speak wickedly for God? Talk deceitfully for Him? You're going to get in this place and tell me how it is? He says there in verse 8, will you accept His person? Will you contend for God? Now, now when I first looked at that, I thought, accept his person, accept the person. But I think he's saying, are you going to be, in the, are you going to be the person of God? Are you going to contend for him and fight for him? You're kind of taking his place, are you? We accept his person. You're so anxious to be perceived as being as smart as God that you'll put yourself in the place of God to prove it. God does not need you to defend him, especially since he is not spoken. See, there's, there's the thing here. Instead of having a prayer meeting and praying for Job and praying for the answer, they've already made up their mind. 
I will sit in the seat of God and pontificate this and tell you exactly what's going on. Why? Because I know the Bible. <laughs> but you don't know what God's decided about this. You don't know what happened. You weren't there. Got to be careful. Sometimes you think you've got all the, oh, I know everything I need to know about this situation, and you pass a judgment. But God has not spoken yet. Because when God does get done spoken, guess who's in trouble? <laughs> the three amigos are in trouble. Because they thought they could, they could sit in the place of God. I think that's what a pope does when he speaks ex cathedra. That's out of the chair. He thinks he's speaking in the place of God. Hmm. They don't do that very often. It's kind of hard to speak infallibly. Do you know that? <laughs> um, I mean, say one wrong thing. <laughs> So they don't do it very often because they've, they've been proven so wrong in the past. How could you be wrong if you're infallible? <laughs> okay. I think it proves its own point, right? I don't think it's happened. I, I don't remember the last time it's happened. 1800s, I mean early 1900s. Not, not very often. Maybe you can find that out. Last time the Pope spoke ex cathedra. Um, When you come across something and you're just, you're just not sure, rather than pass a judgment or rather than say something that, you know, you've opened your mouth before you should have, let God weigh in. Listen, there's always time for some prayer. There's always time for some prayer. Um, sometimes I've, you know, you know, there's some type of mystery involved with it, and I said, Lord, I, I, I need to know. So I asked God, I said, you need to show me what's going on here. You need to give me understanding about this situation. If any man like, not, like wisdom, let him ask of God. And you can ask God for wisdom to deal with a, a situation. Because you, you may not understand it. And the best thing to do is let God weigh in on it. Because usually, he'll re, I mean, if you'll give, just give him a little bit of time, you know, he will, he will reveal everything. And then you won't be there with egg on your face having to backpedal and back, you know, crawfish because you took a position you shouldn't have took because you didn't wait to, hit, to see the thing out or to see the thing work itself out. Uh, that verse, yeah, Proverbs 18, 13, that's where I had it. I knew I had it somewhere. He that answered the matter before he heareth it is folly and a shame unto him. So here's what you need to remember. And we'll finish with this. God can speak for himself. Do not doubt that. I mean, he's actually talking to Job here in the book. God can speak for himself, and he, can, and he will. So you don't need to just rush in there in, in, in the place of God and pass judgment when you don't know. Now, if, if the three amigos lived with Job, and they had been there when the Sabians came, and they had been there when they had seen Job sacrificing for his children and praying and having fellowship with God, and they're all sitting around and they're reading their Bibles together, you know, they probably would have had better understanding and say, you know, Job, it's a total mystery why this has happened to you because I don't understand it. But they weren't there. All they know is they come into town, they, oh, you haven't heard? Oh, Job, you know that fellow over there? Man, God clocked him good. God cleaned his clock. He's got nothing left. Oh, man, I knew something was wrong with him. He looked too good to be true. <laughs> Um, I've got a verse here I wrote down about God, God being able to speak for himself. It says in Acts 17, verse 24 and 25, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. I try to go through the Bible and find one thing that says God needs. I can't find it. I look need, needeth, needed. I mean, I couldn't find anything God needed. Now, there's some things the Lord would like to have and want, but he, doesn't need any, he didn't need anything. He doesn't need us to, to stand in his place and make a judgment call without all the facts. Now, the Bible does say that, you know, he that is spiritual judgeth all things. When you got the book on it, you can make a judgment. But when you don't know the matter... You have to be just like Joe's three friends who said, kept your mouth shut and waited and said, okay, 
Let's wait till the Lord clears this thing up. Then you too, because of your silence, you too will be a wise man. So the next time you're sitting in a conference or you're sitting in a meeting, just keep completely silent. And before it's all over with, you will be the wisest man in the room. Because inevitably, everybody else is going to say something stupid. <laughs> all right. Any questions about what we covered tonight? 1950. Ooh, that's Hitler's Pope. Wow. Hitler's Pope, Pope Pius XII, that was uh, Eugene Pacelli. He was a lawyer. Eugene Pacelli. Yeah, speaking of ex-cathedra about Mary. Boy, he got that wrong, didn't he? He prayed pray to Mary the Mediatrix. Nobody, nobody in the Bible ever prayed to Mary. Nobody asked her anything. <laughs> Kind of interesting. Huh? Oh, uh, I think that she's, she's up. She's up there. Yep. Got her, got her ascending somehow. I don't know where because somewhere along the line. Yeah, I mean, they've got her sinless. They've got her... I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm surprised they don't have her virgin born too. They talk.